see. Right, so uh, in my remarks, I'm going to try to bring together the two strands of argument and discussion that have taken place uh, today, in the morning and in the afternoon. The state of international human rights on the one hand, and the quality of human rights bodies. Uh, and given that I'm the last speaker before the discussion session, I will also try to conclude with a series of questions for us to reflect on. Now, first of all, let me say that these two levels, the state of human rights and human rights institutions, are interconnected. And each of these levels is in turn connected to a further level. The state of human rights is a function, uh, to a very significant extent, of the quality of the institutions that are set up to enforce them. And we've heard uh, various arguments and data on that point. Uh, both the state of human rights and the human rights institutions are shaped by our ideas about human rights. That famous line from Hegel is also true for human rights. Once the world of ideas has been transformed, reality cannot hold out for long. And this is not uh, to say that I'm not, like uh, Emily, also a pragmatist, but it, it's just accepting the fact that beliefs and ideas are sometimes the most important causes, and we've been thinking and reflecting on what the causes might be of what is going wrong, and I think we shouldn't uh, forget the role of bad ideas. And it isn't just a one-way street, because these institutions in turn generate ideas, or to use the more fashionable postmodernist jargon, they generate discourses uh, which shape both the way we think and the way we act. And this is what I would like to focus on. Uh, the uh, intellectual, a number of intellectual and juridical inventions of the international human rights system and consider the ways in which these inventions, these ideas, may have had an impact on our conception of, uh, uh, of human rights. And here I agree with uh, uh, Judge Thielen who uh, criticized uh, uh, professors and in fact I think it was Heinrich Heine, uh, the German poet, who said that ideas conceived in the quiet of a professor's study can given time destroy a civilization. And I think there are a lot of bad ideas which professors have come up with and policymakers have been too quick to adopt that have done a lot of damage to the system. So let me begin with one very difficult area, and that's the limitation of rights. A number of important rights protected under the European Convention on Human Rights are subject to limitation clauses. Now typically, these limitation clauses appear in the second subsection of the provision. So for example, Article 10 of the European Convention of Human Rights protects the right to free expression at subsection 1, and then at subsection 2 adds that the exercise of this right may be subject to formalities, conditions, restrictions, or penalties in order to pursue a series of objectives. Now, the limitation of rights is a very difficult question. Philosophically, legally, morally, it's an extremely difficult problem. Most of us, even uh, the most liberal or among us, would agree that with a few exceptions, most rights cannot always be unlimited. But the question is, how do we limit them? How do we go about drawing the line between what is permitted and what is forbidden? Some bill of right, bills of rights, interestingly, uh, protect rights without reference to limitation. And to stay with uh, the example of free speech, that is the case of the First Amendment in the US uh, Bill of Rights. That is not to say that that right is unlimited in, uh, in, in, in that constitutional law, for example, but it is more difficult for the courts in that case to find ways of limiting a right which prima facie should be unlimited. Limitation clauses are a feature of not just the ECHR, but a number of other human rights uh, treaties. The prevalent approach to the interpretation of these limitation clauses is premised on the principle of proportionality. And it's a principle that is an interesting history which the former president of the Israeli Supreme Court, Judge Aaron Barak, has traced in his book entitled Proportionality. 
To some extent, it seems that this idea is the invention of German administrative law sometimes in the 1920s, but it is not the history of proportionality that interests me here. It's what proportionality does to the idea of human rights. And the way it works is through this principle of balancing. You have this right, but the exercise of this right has to balance against a series of competing interests, other socially important uh, goods. Now, how does this change the idea of uh, human rights? Let me illustrate this point with a metaphor. If I own a garden, uh, not a, an unlimited garden, they would mean owning uh, the entire world, but a garden that has a limit, uh, and that limit is uh, 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 identified by a fence, there is no doubt that I am sovereign uh, within the turf, that I am sovereign within the territory delimited by that fence. If instead I am told that I own a garden which is limited by a fence that is a variable position, depending on the interests of my neighbors. If my neighbors come up with a strong interest and the fence has to be moved, then the quality of my ownership will be very different. I may still describe myself as the owner of that garden, but it will be ownership in a precarious, weaker, and fundamental indeterminate sense. Human rights that are limitable in this open-ended way through proportionality are weak uh, rights. So what I'm really trying to emphasize is the impact that uh, this central idea now in the, in the practice of human rights in international courts and in a lot of domestic courts has on the quality of our liberty and of our human rights. And there is something else here that is happening that I think is quite interesting and important. Before proportionality is applied to human rights, these limitable rights may actually be very wide in scope. And this is because these rights begin with a very wide assertion of principle. As I said uh, in Article 10 of the ECHR, everyone has the right to freedom of expression. And it is only the enjoyment of the right which is limited through proportionality. It's a two-pronged approach which distinguishes between the scope of the right, which is determined first, and the extent of the right's realization. Now, a consequence of this way of formulating rights and interpreting them is that their scope, their scope may at first be very generously defined in the knowledge that the exercise of the right can subsequently be restricted. And it is not surprising that fundamental rights uh, defined, interpreted, and applied in this way become, as a famous German scholar Robert Alexky has put it, and a defender of proportionality, uh, human rights in this way become ubiquitous. Now, you might say, if you're in favor of human rights, surely you should be happy about their ubiquity. Can we ever have enough of something as good as and important as human rights? As in the Beatles song, they're here, there, and everywhere. Surely that's a good thing. But this superficially attractive position is very problematic. Now first, ubiquity uh, entails the inflation and dilution of human rights. Uh, Jacob has addressed uh, this point uh, before. Individuals have many rights, but they're all subject to this Damocles sword of proportionality. Uh, and if you forgive me another metaphor, it's a bit like owning a big house with a huge mortgage. It can be taken away from you. Now, crucially, human rights ubiquity risks generating a very unhealthy public culture and rights. And I think that is what uh, has happened to some extent in Europe. The reason why this public culture of rights is unhealthy is because it is characterized by the combination of entitlement followed by disappointment. You have the right, but now we're taking it away from you because there is some other interest that we have to balance it against. So we're given the right, but we then have to surrender it. Uh, and I think this uh, uh, mechanism uh, 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 that is central to how international human rights are applied, and as I said, also some uh, constitutional rights in many systems these days, is very important for understanding some of the other issues that have been brought up by previous presenters, in particular the question of awareness about rights and elitism. 
what are we exactly expecting people to be aware of if rights are so loosely and unclearly defined? If, rights have, uh, uh, if we want rights to be owned by people and understood by people, they have to be clear. Um, because uh, human rights obviously do not pertain just to the realm of uh, adjudication. They should be central to public argument and awareness of them, is, as, as Emily in particular has, has stressed, is very uh, important. Um, and I think this uh, ubiquity of rights uh, with, uh, with its connected idea that every social problem is a human rights problem and that we're all in the first instance victims has brought the human rights system into, uh, into disrepute. Now, some of you uh, with uh, connections to Britain may know that uh, in Britain there has been quite a lot of public debate on the European Convention on Human Rights for some time. And I think criticism, fierce criticism of that court probably started in Britain. Uh, until a few years ago, uh, there was a certain patrician attitude uh, uh, in the left, mainly but not exclusively, which dismissed that public criticism as uh, originating from uncouth readers of the Daily Mail, you know, those barbarians. Uh, but I think things have changed, and they've changed quite significantly in Britain. And the change began a few years ago when uh, judges who began to retire started celebrating their retirement with a speech that was critical of the Strasbourg court. Now, uh, people wearing judicial robes are not usually uh, barbarians. And we've had more and more judges, with exceptions perhaps, but we'll not go into those. We've had more and more judges in recent years criticizing uh, that, uh, uh, that, that court. Uh, and that's obviously uh, partly because in Britain, as a result of the Human Rights Act, the legislation that copies and pastes the European Convention of Human Rights into British domestic law, British judges have been forced into what some describe as a dialogue and other more realistically as a subjugation to, uh, towards the European court. And so it's a very acute and real issue, the relationship with Strasbourg. It's a constitutional problem uh, in, uh, in Britain. I generally share the analysis and concerns that these judges have uh, 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 advanced, but I think the crucial role that is, that is played by Strasbourg's double-edged rights expansionism has not received the analytical attention that it deserves. Now, let me move from proportionality to another invention um, of the international human rights system, which I suspect may also affect the idea of human rights, and that's the notion of progressive realization. Now, this principle appears in Article 2 of the International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights. Uh, the committee established under that covenant has also spent considerable time developing this uh, principle. And the principle, in essence, recognizes that economic social rights the human right to health, for example, are not fully achievable in the short term, and that their realization must therefore be progressive. Now again, this idea may at first seem entirely uh, plausible. Um, we can't surely expect poor countries to protect people's health to the fullest degree overnight. But progressive realization, like balancing and proportionality, is, in my view, quite an insidious idea. Because on the one hand, we are saying that human rights are fundamental, uh, with the universal declaration of human rights characterizing disregard and contempt for human rights as barbarous acts which have outraged the conscience of mankind. But on the other hand, we are telling the bearers of these rights that the full realization can be postponed. It is tantamount to saying that something which is morally imperative, and you're entitled to that, is not possible. So the state is obliged to do something of the greatest importance, but it cannot yet do it. So what does it, such an approach entail for, again, our public cultural rights and freedoms? Uh, regardless of the theoretical justification which might be advanced for this tension between, between can and ought, the public culture that results, in my view, will be one of insatiability, disenchantment, and even cynicism. 
And let me uh, uh, conclude before I move on to uh, a more analytical part, trying to tease out various themes from the earlier discussions. Let me conclude with another example this, uh, of, um, of uh, human rights ideas that uh, are problematic. And that's the extraterritorial application of human rights in times of war. Now, the regulation of war has always posed a dilemma for the law. On one approach, associated with Immanuel Kant, the very idea of a law that regulates war is a contradiction in terms, for war is the negation of law. On another approach, generally associated with Grotius and with the birth of international law, there can be a law of war, but that law must be distinct from the law of peace. You shouldn't confuse the two because we want, in times of peace, to be governed by laws that are different from the laws that govern us in times of war. Now, the European Court of Human Rights, but also the International Court of Justice, entered this complex and in many ways, again, intractable moral and philosophical dilemma without very much uh, grace. Uh, it, the case on this topic is, is very wide and I couldn't do justice to it in a few sentences, but it starts from the principle that human rights do not cease uh, in wartime. Again, a principle that would seem to be uh, a good one uh, superficially, uh, but that is actually very uh, problematic. There is almost a sense nowadays in the human rights community that the Geneva Conventions and the laws of war are in some ways passé. And uh, uh, human rights can address all of the questions that regard war, and we don't need the special body uh, of rules. But what is now also clear is that the application of human rights to war has come at a price. And that price is a further method for slicing rights. And the keys in a number of cases decided by the Strasbourg Court and now also by uh, English courts, where the European Court now speaks of tailoring and dividing rights. Uh, and it isn't clear what the tailoring, the limits of this tailoring and dividing of rights uh, should be. In one case, the court says, well, it's only the rights that are relevant to the situation of the individual that we will enforce, not the others. But what does that mean when we're talking about uh, uh, fundamental human rights? In which theory will it be decided that certain rights are relevant to people in Copenhagen but not in Helmand, given that the premise of all this is that we're applying human rights to uh, armed conflict. Now, a question that I find particularly interesting is where do these ideas come from? What is their intellectual pedigree? How do these judges, lawyers, professors, officials come up with them? Uh, these are all practical uh, men and women, it may be objected, they have to deal with the realities of the world and they have no time for legal and political uh, philosophy. But uh, with John Minor Keynes, I also think that practical men who think of themselves as exempt from any intellectual influence are usually the slaves of some defunct theorist. And in these institutional and judicial creations, ideas like proportionality and balancing, dividing and tailoring, progressive realization, and others that we haven't even had time to touch on, like indivisibility, and I don't quite know what happened to the dogma of indivisibility now that we have a doctrine of dividing and tailoring, so there are also problems in terms of simple logic. But in all of these ideas, I do not hear much of the classical liberal tradition that invented human rights, but rather it seems to me that the moral and political theories behind these notions are, uh, ec have echoes of utilitarianism, of various forms of reductionism, and in some cases, and not so distantly, even of uh, uh, Marxism. Um, now, uh, let me just, uh, I've got a few, five more minutes. Okay. Oh, I see. Well, then I'll say it in two minutes. But we, we have a, a question and answer session later. Um, so uh, we, uh, our research project, as you heard before, raises a difficult, a series of difficult and and for many uncomfortable uh, questions. And really, our intention is to generate uh, argument and even controversy with a view to strengthening. Uh, basic, uh, basic freedoms. Now, from, from our research and from today's presentations, I, I jotted down a few questions that it seems to me are really quite uh, important and, 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 and pressing. Is the proliferation of human rights uh, really uh, a good thing? 
our human rights losing their moral cl clarity. I think David used that expression. It's very important, in my view, for assessing where human rights are. Should uh, international uh, judges give human rights treaties interpretations that the state parties have not even contemplated and in some cases have expressly rejected? Is there a risk that legal principles and doctrines which have been developed by these institutions might end up weakening human rights? Are human rights like freedom of expression well served by the uh, international uh, human rights system? There is also uh, a, a crucial question that concerns strategy. Uh, how do we, and we've heard uh, a lot uh, uh, before in Paula's presentation, what is the most effective strategy in advancing human rights in these uh, international uh, fora? Um, there are uh, quite a lot of other things happening in the world of international law in general where governments are experimenting with new ways of promoting compliance. So for example, in the area of government transparency, the Open uh, Government Partnership has been quite a success. It is a very lean secretariat, no huge bureaucracy, but it has put a lot of pressure on countries that were in the second tier on issues of transparency to actually improve their record and join the club of the better, the better country. So perhaps we should think outside the uh, tools of more traditional diplomacy that we have so far used in the human rights uh, sphere. And I think the uh, final and crucial question, which is a question of, of, of strategy and, and the politics, but really central to human rights, as we move towards a period that is marked by a decline in, uh, in, in, in Western power, uh, are we leaving an international human rights system that is really well equipped to deal with the rise of new powers, uh, which while often liberal in an economic sense, may not be liberal in a political sense? I'll stop here. Um, I think that we, uh, it, we could uh, perhaps just uh, start off with our, with our, with our panel uh, discussion. Uh, unless someone has a burning question to Guillermo, we actually do have one uh, in the back, so let's, let's go with that. Thanks, um, thank you for a, a very good and interesting paper. I just had one question about this, um, your critique of balancing and proportionality in rights. And is, isn't it a sense that in some ways we always have to think about limiting rights in some sense? I mean, even John Stuart Mill said that, you know, liberty can be restricted with prevention of harms to others. And we don't need to talk about rights inflation to see that. As you know, in Article 10 to of the ECHR, one of the grounds for restricting the freedom of expression is the rights of others, and that includes, includes the rights to privacy of others, which is a classic liberal right in itself. So even within the doctrine of liberty itself, we have an essential incoherence that requires some sort of resolution of, of, of patrolling these borders. And I think there are different ways we can do that. What proportionality and balancing offers is something that goes in the direction of respecting legality and the rule of law and not just tossing your coin or not just arbitrarily deciding, well, today we privilege expression, tomorrow we privilege privacy. So I was just wondering how, if, if it is so problematic, how would you go about drawing that line, even on a very restricted liberal catalogue of rights? I think in, in terms of the formulation of a right, um, uh, th there is one type of limitation clause that I would prefer to the Article 10 type of limitation clause, and that's the limitation clause that says, this right finds a limit in. There's an important analytical difference between saying you have a right, but its enjoyment can be limited, and saying you have a right that is limited here. You know, again, with the metaphor of the fence, you have a fence and that is there. Beyond there, there's no right. You're in a different realm. Uh, so I think analytically that approach which some constitutions have is preferable. Another approach is to have rights that in terms of their formulation do not refer to limitations. And then constitutional jurisprudence will slowly and painfully, as it is done in the United States, come up with ways of uh, finding very, very narrow limitations. I mean, I think we agree that there will have to be some limitations and there will be a gray area. But that open-ended limitation clause with a series of uh, social objectives in the name of which rights can be restricted is, in my view, quite dangerous. Just take your name and, and yeah. My name 
name is Klaus Dorgat. I'm a retired lawyer. I have a question to the panel. Um, do you think that sanctions, in order to implement human rights in oppressive states, that sanctions, economic, military, or political sanctions, will do the trick? As a proposal to this, the subject of this conference, will sanctions do the trick? All right, that was, uh, that, that's one we can save for the general panel. Uh, Aaron, did you have one specific for Guillermo? Uh, uh, okay. You said that, um, you said that um, the notion of progressive realization was somehow insidious in human rights and that it was connected to the question of economic and social and cultural rights. And, and maybe I missed it, but could you explain, okay, we understand that the, that the realization of those social and economic rights is, takes time. Uh, did you mean that we get the idea from this that the realization of all kinds of rights should also take time? Um, because uh, that's my question. Um, and my, my answer to that would be yes. Um, well, I think there are two different answers. Uh, in terms of a, a, a moral theory of rights, the answer has to be, in my view, that if it is a right and it is fundamental uh, and, and, and it isn't just like any other interest you might have, then its realization should be immediate. Uh, in the uh, practice of rights, we know that you know, developments in legal systems will take time. It takes a long time for a country to develop a fair trial system. But that is not to say that the right itself can wait. Again, there are two different propositions and I think the idea of progressive realization is, is the kind of uh, fake pragmatism that really does change the nature of the underlying right, and that's why I find it so, so insidious. Uh, it hasn't played the same role in civil and political rights as it has in uh, economic, social, and cultural rights. Okay, well, that's fine, Dr. Okay. Uh, well, you see, uh, I think, I mean, I'm, I'm not so... Uh, knowledgeable about the philosophy of human rights, but just the practice. And, and it's quite obvious, and we talked earlier that uh, Denmark has been very much involved in the protection of torture. But when, when torture is discussed in, uh, in international NGOs and in the international political community, it's very much subject to a kind of watery social scientific um, terminology where they talk about, well, torture is a process. And torture depends on culture, it depends on practices and, and uh, you know, traditions, and then and stopping torture requires a change in culture and a change in institutions. Stopping torture requires a decree. And, it's, and, it's a, and, it, and this, is a, this is something that, that countries like Turkey, which know how to play the game, hide behind and keep torturing people because they know because they, because they know that, uh, that, that it's considered so, such a complicated question that they can get away with it. 